Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Prophecy Roundtable. I'm your host, Dr. Douglas Hamp. We've got Scott over here, you know, over there. There we go. Yeah, he's over there. Everything's backwards. And down here, down there we go. <laughs> There's Chris. Okay. <laughs> oh, we're glad that uh, Chris Stanley has joined us today. Uh, we are talking about the question Is there such a thing as a pre trib rapture? Well, uh, a little confession. Okay, so I was raised in an environment where I was told that there is a rapture going to happen any moment. Don't know when. You got to be ready. Okay, and that's how I lived really all of my life until I don't know somewhere in my early forties. I think maybe late thirties, early forties, somewhere in there. And um, I just took it as gospel. Okay, now I used to teach at the Calvary Chapel School of Ministry in Costa Mesa, California. And that was very, very dispensational, very fundamental, and very uh, much into the pre-trib rapture. And I just took it as gospel, right? That was just the way things were, and that was that. All right, and I thought we had amazing arguments for this. And then a little by little, my arguments started to not work out so well. All right. And I was actually writing a book called the Millennium Chronicles. And what I wanted to do, I want to talk about the millennium, but only talk about verses or only talk about things that I could actually find in scripture. Right? That was my crazy idea at the time. All right. And uh, though the book wasn't about the, the, the uh, tribulation per se, I, I wanted to kind of have some flashbacks so that we could kind of have context as to how did we get here? And I kept looking for that verse. I'm like, now where is that verse? You know, I want to put it in the book. And where's the verse that says that it's going to happen before the tribulation, the rapture? I couldn't find it. It was driving me bananas, right? And so at back at the time, this was around 2012. I was a real, you know, superstar back then. Uh, I was speaking at all these different conferences. I was on Prophecy in the News. And, uh, you know, speaking at these conferences, pre-trib rapture conferences, I realized that I didn't know where the preacher of rapture verse. And it turns out the guys that I was speaking with, they didn't know where it was either. And when I asked them, they all got pretty upset about it. Eh, that wasn't so good. And that probably helped you know, get me off <laughs> some of those uh, those tours, right? I wasn't invited back. So even though I was still preacher at the time, right? I still believed in that basic scenario. So over time, I began to realize it's just not there. Okay, and I kind of liken it to you guys remember this uh, this commercial way back when from Wendy's. Okay, you got these ladies there. Here they are. They're looking at all the bun. Big question: Where's the beef? Okay, where's the beef? Okay, so that's how I feel that the pre-trib rapture doctrine is. Pre-trib has a lot of fluff, but where's the verse? And for me, that was everything. Where is the verse. And if we don't have a verse for a pre-trib rapture, then guess what? We don't have a pre-trib rapture. I think it's that simple. All right. Now it may not say this is the pre-trib rapture verse, right? I'm not looking for that, but I'm looking for verses that will give me substance that will say, you know, the catching away the, you know, being, being caught up, the rapture, the gathering or something is going to happen before the tribulation. Something to that effect, okay? And guess what? It's not there. Now, this is where pre-tribbers, and I was just getting into it the other day with somebody on Facebook, and I'm trying to spend a lot less time on Facebook, but once in a while I get sucked into these little conversations because people put my name in things. So I'm like, hmm, what's going on here? All right, so this person had posted the intimidating list, dun, 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 right? And I was like, oh, here we go again, right? So you can see there, all those verses in green, in the green box, those are the pre-trib rapture verses, okay? And, and so what they do is they say, oh, what do you mean there's no verses about the pre-trib? Look at this list. And you're like, oh my goodness, I'm such a fool to, to disagree with the pre-trib rapture because look at all those verses. All right, now I'm not going to go through all those at the moment, but what I did is I, in my presentation, and, and in uh, Chris and I wrote a book called Reclaiming the Rapture, 
in that book, my part of it is I went through every one of those verses on the intimidating list. And I said, okay, what does it really say? And you know what? It's not there. I'm going to just show you one. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, I promise. But I just want to show you one. Okay, so notice here, here on the, on the list, John 14, one through three. Check it out. You guys be the judge, all right? John 14, one through three. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. All right, now I'm going to get, no, I'm going to get into these other verses. Okay, so the good question is, where is a pre-trib rapture? So again, looking at this, notice, don't be troubled, right? Believe in God, believe in me. My Father's house are many rooms. Okay, we all agree with that, right? And Jesus is going to prepare a place for us. Hallelujah. And he's going to go and come back so that we can be with him. That's great, right? So I think everybody who's a Christian would believe that. But the question is, where does it say that this is going to happen before the beginning of the tribulation? And answer, it doesn't say it anywhere. All right. I'm going to open the floor to my amazing guest. Just real quick. Terminology is very important here. Uh, a couple of our, our mutual friends, that get mad at me for saying things like, you can't change the terms. But even when talking about the tribulation period, a lot of people just assume that's a seven-year period that's not even in Scripture. There is a great tribulation. I think... I think pretty much everybody even agrees that that period is going to be 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years. But e even that is, I think, when we're talking biblical terms, uh, getting the correct terms is, is key. Um, and y'all wrote a book on it as far as this 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 word that, that's been interpreted in the Latin as rapturio uh, is not even the, the, the word that everybody thinks it is, the harpazo, the snatching away. It's actually, and you you guys can help me out with my Greek non-pronunciation here, but it's harpage samitha, which is not the same exact word as a harpazo. So again, when Doug asked me to do this, I I you know I cringed a little bit because of the title. I I like the term gathering. You know, I, I like it's everywhere in scripture as opposed to one word that we've taken the Latin term. And it's not even the actual harpazo for snatching away word in the text, although Strong's has it as that. So that's I'm, I, I think I need to step in here before people tune out <laughs> and, and explain that Thanks. Greek word a little bit, because uh, this is uh, uh, wow. This is this is really big to a lot of people. And uh, so if you go to verbix.com and you look up the word harpazo, you're going to find a listed as uh, under, uh, well, it's the, it's the first person plural future passive indicative <laughs> of harpazo. And, and the word is harpasthesametha. And so that's what the word would be if it were based on harpazo. But there's another similar word called harpage. And the word that's actually in all of the Greek-based texts, source texts, is harpagesametha. And that word has a totally different meaning. It doesn't mean to be snatched away. It, it's the difference between being taken away and having something taken from you. So what Paul's describing is the, the plundering or the redemption of the body, the subduing of the body three uh, that he's able to subdue our our lowly body and that it be conformed to his glorious body that's that's what paul is describing there and the word plunder is even found in um isaiah i believe it's chapter 25 where it's talking about the earth shall be plundered and and so this transformation of of the earth and the body is represented by that word harpagesametha. That's what's in your, that's what's in the Bible in the Greek text, and it's not based on the word harpazo at all. It's based on the word harpage. So um, there it is. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you, Chris, for that good explanation. Appreciate that. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we have to kind of geek out on the exact terms because otherwise we can use them very loosely and grandly. And I think that is when we get into a lot of trouble, quite frankly, uh, in a lot of situations because we're not being careful with our terminology. Uh, and so that is definitely one of the things that, that uh, Chris and I wanted to do in reclaiming the rapture uh, because um, otherwise, again, we're just kind of saying a bunch of stuff. Now, Scott, I, I hear you scoffing and I, I know why I get it. In fact, we, we deal with this term uh, gathering in the book and I would absolutely 100% agree with you. Uh, it's just people, you know, when you search the term, right, it's kind of what's the key word. The key word is rapture. Right, so. it's, a, it's a teaching technique. In other sure. words, when you mock the term or scoff at the term and you don't even use the term and call it zapture, you know, the, 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 the passage, the passage in First Thessalonians 417, it certainly does mention those alive at his coming and there will be a catching up to the cloud. But the passage is, is, is a little mini resurrection passage. And I discussed that with you, Doug, that that when we look at a parallel passage, which is much more in depth, and this, and I've had this discussion with Nelson uh, Walters and Sam, and and we can have ha have them on because they'll have an alternative view than 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 what we actually believe as far as the timing of this gathering. But one of the key texts I think is First Corinthians fifteen, where it talks about the order of the resurrection, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and he was the first fruits from the dead. Uh, there were additional people resurrected that time. The graves split open. And then Matthew records that there's a bunch of dead people that have been resurrected walking around in Jerusalem. Then at his coming, at, uh, and so we have another resurrection at his coming. Um, and then, then comes the end. So I believe that what that's saying is there, there, there was the first fruits resurrection when Yeshua was resurrected. There's going to be another resurrection at his coming. And then we see in Revelation 20, we see a resurrection at the end. You see that second resurrection. It's blessed are those who want to be part of the first resurrection. And so that's that I, I believe this passage and Revelation 20 gives our pre wrath brothers um, a a a problem as much as it does uh, pre-tribulation people who who believe the gathering is prior to, you know, this great tribulation or what they call a seven year tribulation period. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Uh, Chris, um, share yes. some things with us. <laughs> We're delighted to have you on. So. All right. Well, you know, your, uh, your, yeah, your picking up thing. there in in first uh, Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, going to verse 24, uh, it says, and then comes the end. And it goes on to say that um, he's, he's going to uh, descend and make everything subject to him when he's put all of his enemies under his feet. And his last enemy, it says, is going to be death. And so... This has to do with the resurrection, which which is the conversation immediately following that. See, that's the context. And so the the dead rising has to do with his last enemy being destroyed. And when you go to Acts uh, chapter three, verse 21, it says Jesus must remain in heaven until all his enemies are made his footstool. It's, it's quoting that again. And so his descending um, his coming from heaven is only going to happen one time in all of uh, this age. And it, it's going to be when his enemies are put under his feet. And so when we look at First Thessalonians uh, 4.17, the context of, of that Harpage Sametha, um, it says that he's descending. It says um, he's coming. And so I, I would say again that uh, Paul would never use those terms unless he was describing the second coming, coming because it only happens once. He can't descend from the throne um, and come until all those enemies are put under his feet. So um, he's not going to 
it doesn't say he's calling from heaven. Um, it, it says he's descending, he's coming. So by that alone, it makes the first Thessalonians chapter four um, rapture uh, during the second coming and not uh, before the tribulation. You know, in our book, this is the book, it's Reclaiming the Rapture that Doug and I wrote. Uh, there are some quotes in here by people who were um, the great reformers. And I have a number of them in here, but uh, uh, I have John Calvin as one because people were, were bringing this up during his time. And I'll see if I can find it here. Uh, well, of course. Don't you hate that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I had it. I had it. I had it marked here. Well, okay, let's yeah. go back to that three and a half year thing, because that's also mentioned in here, and the whole idea of uh, an imminent return of Jesus in his parables. Um, in a couple of his parables, he describes the time of his return. It says it, it's like a a man who went away to a far country. And it was so far that basically his servants kind of forgot all about him in the meantime. And, um, and in another one is the same, is the same way, uh, talking about being gone for a long time. And so right off the bat, you have uh, Jesus' own words that are indicating it's going to be a while before he returns. But in the context of uh, the dispensational understanding, the pre-trib understanding, they say that uh, the, the man of sin or uh, the abomination of desolation, the beginning of the time of God's wrath is going to happen three and a half years after the pre-tribulation rapture. And so what that means is that there has to be uh, the Jews back in the land, uh, and they have to have rebuilt uh, a temple or someplace to have those sacrifices. And that didn't happen until 1948. And the um, Temple Institute, and as far as uh, the Jews uh, beginning to have those, those sacrifices is, is just now, uh, we may be contemporary with that. But you see, there's got to be an immediate three and a half years after that to fit in with the dispensational timeline. And so you couldn't have had a pre-tribulation rapture over the centuries up until right now uh, in order to meet that timeline, that three and a half year timeline. So their own uh, trajectory, <laughs> it, 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 it defeats their idea of an imminent return without a tribulation first but we see that in in calvin's writings we see it in uh the early church historians uh calling for tribulation first in fact that's who calvin is quoting and so from from the beginning they've thought the tribulation would come before um before the return of christ and the rapture We'll just call it the rapture. <laughs> no, no, y'all can. <laughs> <laughs> hey, real quick on that imminent issue. And and this is prevalent not only with dispensational theology, but also with full replacement theology. I like to call dispensationalism temporary replacement theology. These systematic theologies do not understand the feast, the Moedim. They, it, it's like... It's like there is a blind spot to his appointed times. And Paul, it, it's, it, I think it's like top three list of worst chapter breaks between 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul is basically saying, guys, I've already told you when Yeshua is returning. I don't even need to teach you anymore about the times and the seasons, about the appointed times. He's coming back on Yom Teruah, and that's why Paul mentioned trumpets. That's why Yeshua mentions the trump. 
That's why John says uh, in Revelation at the last trump. That's why, in, again, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, he mentions at the last trump. This, these are Paul's not making up new theology. He is he's been giving a revelation. He's he, he's he now knows that Yeshua fulfilled Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Shavuot, Pentecost was fulfilled. Next up to be fulfilled is is Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. So unless and it and and it's 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 God. I believe God and and you got a teaching on this, Doug. We used to read, and I used to read Romans 11 and see that Israel was blinded and think those poor Jews, you know, they, they can't see that Yeshua is Messiah. But I believe all Israel, including the ecclesia, the church, those of us from the house of Israel, those of us, regardless of DNA grafted in, have been blinded to this for the last 1900 years. And it's only been in the past 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years that you really see um, believers starting to understand the Moedim and the prophetic nature of the Moedim and the entire redemptive gospel story. So now I see this, it was the Moedim, it was his feast studying them for prophecy five years ago that the reason I see this now, and now it's, it's frustrating because I'm like, if you would just spend the time to yeah. study these, these feasts, just study them from a prophecy standpoint, Yep. The scales will fall off if you're yep. if you're if you're willing to follow where truth leads you, because, again, Rome had had Roman Catholicism had everybody bound up until about what the 14, 1500s. And then Martin Luther discovered the just shall live by faith. Other theologians then had different. Well, what about baptism? Why are why are we baptizing babies into the church? Why not? We having adult baptism and then. Again, yet there's been a progress as they search the scriptures and, and but when they did, and thank God we do live in America, but when they did, people died. I mean, Zwingli, well, you want to be baptized? Okay, we'll baptize you. But again, it is hard when you're coming against a creed or a denominational doctrine or something that, that Doug, you were brought born and raised in, I was born and raised in. It is it is hard to unlearn that because it's easier to fool a man than it is to convince him he's been fooled. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to dispensational theology, they get the part right. And that's the other part I wanted to address from Matthew 24. They 100% get the part right that God will keep his promises to Israel. They 100% understand that God does have a plan for Judah and the Jews, the house of Judah. What they cannot see and are blind to is the ecclesia, the church, was in the wilderness. The church is Israel. We don't replace Israel. The church doesn't temporarily replace Israel, which is what dispensationalism is. And they'll take passages like Matthew 24 and Mark 13, and they'll say the elect in those passages are for, that's the Jews. We're the church. We're different than the Jews. We're, we're, that's a different elect. But then they'll like Revelation 17, 14. It's the same exact word, electos. These will wage war against the lamb and the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And those who are with him are the called and the electos, the chosen, the elect and faithful. First Peter 2, 9. But you are a elect chosen people. Uh, you know, in Romans 8, uh, Romans 8, 33. Who will bring charges against God elect? And every Christian would claim those verses, but then when it comes to the same exact Greek word that Yeshua used, they'll go, no, 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 that's just the Jews. We're, we're not that elect. We're, we're, we're the elect earlier, you know, mm -hmm. where, where Jesus talks about the elect. So you have this dividing, you have this artificial dividing line created by John Darby about not even 200 years ago. And then Schofield popularized it, and then it got into the seminaries, and now that's what people are just born and raised on it. And they'll go, no, I just read my Bible. Like, no, you are not reading your Bible. You did not see this on your own. Nobody had seen this until the 1830s, and it got popularized. And now you're reading into the text, like you mentioned that John, path, the John 14 passage. There's nothing. We agree. He went away. He prepared a place for us. He's coming back to get us. 
There's nothing in there about a timing, just like the blessed hope passage that they like to pull out. Mm -hmm. You know, the blessed hope. There's nothing in that in that passage that mentions when his coming will be, when our gathering will be. Yeah. It, it's nothing about avoiding tribulation. Chris, I think you had. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, I disagree with that last remark, Scott, because it says right there, his appearing is the glorious hope. It, it's right, his but, appearing. So, it, so the whole no, idea no, of, no, a, no. of a silent or, or mysterious uh, coming of Jesus uh, to to rapture his church for one thing he can't descend off the throne till his enemies uh, have all been destroyed and the other thing is that that hope that blessed hope it is his appearing not some mysterious voice that calls people away ahead of time no 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 I, I'm we're in agreement maybe oh I'm no I know yeah but, but yeah they will take that passage and 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 say that the blessed hope is the pre-trib rapture no right, right. The blessed hope is his appearing. The There's nothing mentioned yeah. in that whole passage in that whole letter about the timing, other than that it completely supports. You know, yeah, I do the, have Chris. Please go on. Yeah, yeah, I do have some more from our book that that um, this is a chapter that's called "Unwinding Common Pre-Trib Assumptions," and you have to remember that uh, uh, Doug and I were both pastors in the Calvary Chapel churches. And so we know uh, what we were <laughs> what we were teaching. We just didn't know quite why we were teaching it. But um, this whole idea of the Church of Philadelphia, this is another thing that they they say is a proof text. And uh, Revelation three ten, because you have kept my commandment to per persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. That's Revelation 3.10. And so, again, uh, looking at the Greek terminology that's used here, there's this, uh, this should take is aris. That's the, the Greek to take or to lift. Um, and teresao or tereso um, is will keep. And so when we look at how these words it's a it's fabulous because we can see these these very same two greek words used by jesus right here in the bible and it's in it's in john 17 15 in his prayer and it says i do not pray that you should take eris them out of the world but that you should keep terese them from the evil one so the answer to this idea that uh, the rapture, the pre-trib rapture is mysteriously being taught in this application to the, uh, the, the church there um, is directly, directly contradicted here, that Jesus doesn't want us taken out of the world. Uh, he wants us to be kept in the world and be kept from the evil one. And then there's, the the worst blunder of all is that they they say that um, well the worst blunder of all is this the wrong church <laughs> the, the uh, church of Philadelphia isn't the last church uh, at at the end of the so called church age that would be the Laodicean church so they they not only have the wrong application they got the wrong church altogether. Wow. <laughs> well, and, and again, I do believe that that one of my pet peeves on this issue is co the conflation of thelipsis with orge, tribulation with wrath. But but we're not destined for wrath. I wholeheartedly agree. And if and if Yeshua and Paul and John and Peter had taught that we will escape the mega thalipsis, the great tribulation period that has come upon this world, then guess what? I would be a pre-great tribulation gathering believer. We're only promised not to face his orge. They are not synonyms. But, I mean, we, 
just, you know, like you said, Doug, I try to avoid this on, on Facebook. I try not to get into any discussions with people on the Zapture doctrine because you're not going to convince them. I mean, they, if, 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 unless they do a serious study and actually want to learn the truth about this, they're just going to continue to regurgitate what they've been taught. And again, you guys taught it, I'm sure. My, my dad wrote a book on it. I just always had a problem with Second Thessalonians chapter two, even as, as a young child that said, concerning his coming and our gathering, let no man deceive you. That cannot happen until one, the apostasy, and two, the man of sin is revealed. That just, I mean, to my, however old I was, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, I mean, I re really did read prophecy and study prophecy as a child. I just, I just loved it. Uh, but that just, I mean, there's two conditions precedent. I'll at least give, I think it's Andy Wood and, and J.D. Farrakh credit for recognizing there's a condition precedent. And what they do with the word apostasy is, is, is twisting scripture beyond any recognition. But at least those guys recognize, hey, his coming and our gathering do have two conditions precedent. But they, it's like Doug and I cannot go pick tomatoes until Doug and I go pick tomatoes. I mean, that, they're, so his coming and our gathering, the rapture, cannot happen until the rapture is a nonsense sentence. And Paul did not write nonsense. It's just, it's, it's, it's actually, you're insulting people by teaching that. <laughs> Amen. You are. It's just, you know, it's sad. Chris. Another one that I have to pick up. And now this gets pretty technical because this, this is for those, um, in the Jesus movement churches, which is mainly the the pre-trib camp, uh, with the words metatauta uh, at the end of Revelation chapter three, and there there's this break point that that all of a sudden uh, everything after that uh, the church isn't there because uh, it it says after these things, well that that phrase. Um, is used, I believe, um, if I have it here, something like 28 times by Paul. And, uh, and it's used even in, in Revelation. And so in chapter 7 of Revelation, opens with the words, after these things, the same metatauta. And you've got that right there on the Greek. You can see that. Uh, Chi meta tauta, tauta. Okay, and so the wrath of God has just come upon the earth at the end of chapter six. So does meta tauta mean that Revelation has no more to say about the wrath of God? That that's the kind of argument that they make using that phrase, and then saying, well, the, they were talking about the church before this, but now it says meta tauta. So now the church is gone. Was well, the wrath of God, wrath of God gone? There, here's another instance in Revelation 7, 9. The 144,000 have just been sealed. And it says, after these things. So does metatauta mean that the Jews are not to be found in the remainder of Revelation? Because they, ha they have to run with it, if that's the case. Um, let's see, the beginning of chapter 18. Okay, um, after these things. So... The, that's talking about um, the, uh, let's see, all of these examples from the book of Revelation demonstrate. Okay, so anyway, it's, it's just used over and over throughout Revelation. So mm -hmm. to say that because those words appear at the end of chapter 3 in Revelation, that Revelation doesn't have anything to say about the church and the church age is over because the letters to the churches have now been read is 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 just the most ridiculous argument and it's it, you got to be really <laughs> scratching for <laughs> proof texts if you're going to use something like that <laughs> let, let me take uh, just a moment and uh i want to i want people who are in maybe the pre-trib camp to look at what some uh, websites and some very prominent speakers actually say about this. All right, so this is from BibleTruth.org. Now notice, <laughs> all right, this is from this guy. I'm not saying this. 
He says the rapture of the body of Christ is not found in the Old Testament for the obvious reason that the institution of the local church was not revealed until the New Testament. The Old Testament deals with God working with the nation of Israel. Okay. And he says the rapture is also not found in the Gospels. And again, the reason being the Gospels primarily deal with Israel, not the churches. The catching up of Christians is a different resurrection, rapture, than that of restored Israel, which was a mystery not revealed to the Jews in the Old Testament. And then God used the Apostle Paul to explain how that believers in the church age have a different relationship with Christ and also a different resurrection. Now, I say that all of these points are false. Now, points one and two are, are the biggies here that I want to point out. He says, look, this entire doctrine is nowhere to be found in the Old Testament. So out of the 66 books that we have, 39 of them do not contain this doctrine. Then this doctrine is also not found in the Gospels. Now, let me think. Let me just do a little quick review here. Who primarily was speaking in the Gospels? Hmm. Oh, yeah, it was Jesus. <laughs> That's right. Jesus. And, and Jesus is the word made flesh. He's God incarnate. He is the one who spoke and all things came into existence. He's our Lord. He's the one who's coming back. I think what his opinion is really important. Just, I don't know, just a hunch. Okay. I think it's incredibly important. So if it's not in the entire corpus of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and it's not in the Gospels where our Lord himself was speaking, that really is very suspect. Right. It's and, not in Paul's letters either. Well, of course, unless, of course, we, you know, we, we we give them that point, which maybe that's being too generous. Of, uh, first yeah, it's not, yeah, no, not okay. giving it to them because Paul, <laughs> they twist Paul into a, pre, into a theological nonsensical pretzel, I hear just you. as I hear Peter you. warned. I know. So, okay, this is from Tim LaHaye. All right. People have heard of Tim LaHaye. He wrote Left Behind. 65 million books were sold on Left Behind. I wish I could sell that many books. All right. Now, he says here, uh, No Fear of the Storm, uh, later titled The Rapture Under Attack. All right. So they, they re renamed this book. He says, One objection to the pre-tribulation rapture is that not one passage of Scripture teaches the two aspects of his second coming separated from, by the tribulation. This is true. But then no one passage teaches a post-trip or <laughs> mid-trip rapture either. Because I would, I would disagree with him. All right. He says no single verse specifically states Christ will come before the tribulation. On the other hand, no single passage teaches he will not come before the tribulation or that he will come in the middle or at the end of the tribulation. Any such explicit declaration would end the debate immediately. All right. So that's Tim LaHaye, kind of a big voice. Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, right? Everyone knows that, right? Well, he wrote another book called The Rapture. He says pre-tribulationalism is based largely on arguments from inference and silence. Lindsay admits that he cannot point to any single, and this is quote, he cannot point to any single verse that clearly says the rapture will occur before the tribulation. All right, so that's Hal Lindsay. All right, David Reagan, this is Lion and Lamb Ministries. This is huge. The Bible never specifically defines the timing of the rapture by tying it to any other event like the reestablishment of Israel or the rebuilding of the temple. Even its proximity to the tribulation is inferred rather than definitely stated. That's because the rapture is an imminent event that could occur at any moment. All right. All right. Um, so how do they support this? Well, they look at shadows. Now, I have a couple of pictures here of shadows. You can see there on the right what what uh, is casting that shadow. Well, a uh, real tree. You know, well, on, on the right side here. Uh, uh, a on the right side. It, well, no, on, on the right side of the picture here, you can see the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. Uh, okay. So how do we know that it's a Statue of Liberty? Because there's a shadow that's being cast, right? But it's only casting a shadow because, all right, class, why is there a shadow being cast? Because there's a real object there, all right? So without a real object, there isn't a shadow, right? It's pretty simple. So if there's not a tree, then there's not a shadow of a tree. If there's not you standing somewhere, you don't see your shadow. If there's not the Statue of Liberty standing right there, then you don't see its shadow. So there has to be something that can cast a shadow. So we can't talk about types and shadows and inference and silence as being 
very good, uh, you know, arguments. Scott, you're a lawyer. Uh, how many how many arguments are you going to win in court based on silence and maybe inference? You you cannot make an argument from silence. You you, <laughs> you actually need evidence, and, right. and that is really. And again, back to Mr. LaHaye uh, and John MacArthur even says, I think in his book on the rapture, uh, gosh, I said the word, um, he even says that you have to read between the lines um, to 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 come up with this this belief. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, it's for LaHaye to say there's no verse which teaches the timing it goes back to his hyper dispensationalism and he has to, they all have to like believe that Yeshua is only talking to what they call the Jews because they think only the Jews are Israel and totally carve mm -hmm. that entire passage out of scripture in Mark 13 yep. and the parallel passage yep. in Luke, because yep. it clearly says, after those days, and it's a passage, it's not a one verse. It talks about the coming great tribulation, and he uses the word great tribulation, not tribulation period. And he says, after those days, that's when the elect will be gathered from the four corners of the earth. Mm -hmm. And to your point, Doug, there are mountains and trees over in the, in the older scriptures pointing to this gathering where Judah and the house of Israel mm -hmm. will mm -hmm. literally be gathered back to the land. Yeah. It's, yep. it's once you can see oh, and, yeah. and let that me the talk church about is not new. Yeah. This, this is, this is like almost a nonsense discussion. <laughs> if you have eyes to see and ears to hear that the ecclesia was in the wilderness that the yeah. ecclesia of the church got preached the same gospel, according to Hebrews 4, in the wilderness. There's not a new gospel. There's not a new ecclesia or church. And, and sadly, Rome did a great job of convincing people that the church is a different entity than Israel. Yeah. L l let, me, uh, let me jump in on that because uh, back when I was a pre-tribber, uh, I was... Um, I was actually, uh, I guess, commissioned by Prophecy in the News. Uh, so that would be Gary Sturman, great guy, not, not bashing him. But uh, I was commissioned by them to write an article because I had written this article, Why God Did Not Elect Calvinists, and they loved it, right? And so I was making the case that, hey, who are the elect? The Jews. Okay, now I've learned since then, I've learned quite a bit. And uh, this is something that all of us share with, with a great passion, which is the commonwealth of Israel. All right. So now I understand, I didn't understand it back then, but now I understand that there are two houses. There used to be one house. There used to be just united Israel that split into two in 932 BC. And then in 722 BC, the Northern kingdom, the 10 tribes, also known as Ephraim, house of Israel, they were sent away, they were divorced, sent away into exile, and we didn't hear from them, okay? Now, the house of Judah remained. And what happened then is the term Jew, or Judah, Yehudi, that became the catch-all phrase over the centuries for Israel. And when I was a dispensationalist, I thought that Jew and Israel were synonymous, but they're not. They're not synonymous. So all three of us here live in different states, right? So, and we're all Americans, right? But it would be incorrect to say that all Americans are Coloradans, right? And quite frankly, I'm glad because I don't want everybody to come here. You guys wouldn't like it here. Don't, don't come to Colorado. Um, go to New Mexico or something uh, or Arizona, right? Um, but anyway, I digress. So what I learned though, is that not all Israel are the Jews, okay? All Jews are Israel, right? It's a very important distinction. And so the way I used to read Matthew 24 was suggesting that because he's talking about his elect, that he's going to go out and gather, that he was only talking about the Jews. And I'll tell you, they loved it. The pre-trib camp was just eating that up. They're like, that's right. And I remember when somebody would bring up Matthew 24 as an argument for 
a, not a pre-trib rapture. I'd kind of get mad. I'm like, wait a second, you're not playing fair. Don't you know you're supposed to maintain a distinction between the church, and between Israel and all this different stuff? And um, and I, I really didn't have good arguments for that. And and since I've really learned and, you know, dived into the Commonwealth of, of Israel theology, it has totally revolutionized my whole perspective. So something that we've been talking about is that you cannot have the pre-trib rapture doctrine without the foundation, without the base of dispensationalism, right? Se separation theology. Yeah. It, it Eternal separate. So in other words, in, instead of a house united, which a house divided against itself cannot stand. So instead of having the house of Israel, the whole house of Israel united, separation theology, dispensationalism teaches a forever separated house. And that, and, and, and this is what's, it's, it's, it's kind of silly. It's like, God can't multitask. He's going to deal with the church was a new entity during the church age, which again is not in scripture, but people quote it as if it's gospel truth. And then after he raptures us, then, then he'll, then, then, you know, we're the bride of Christ. And yet, the father and the son are one, and then the father is going to marry the Jews, and that's his bride. So we've turned God, who was one, into a bigamist. And and when you start having this conversation with people, they're like, no, 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 no. You know, they don't want to see the distinctions between Israel and Judah, between Joseph and Judah, between Ephraim and Judah. And if they would just take a BLB app or a simple computer program and type in Israel Judah, there are over 100 verses which pop up that shows the distinctions. And Doug, I pointed this out, and you know this. These distinctions between Israel and Judah are even prior to when Solomon sinned. They're even prior. They're recorded in First and Second in First and Second Kings, even before the kingdom divided. When Abraham, when David took a census, Judah had 300,000 men and Israel had 500,000. I'm making the numbers up, but even under King David. When King Solomon, it says, and all of Judah and all of Israel enjoyed peace during the reign of Solomon. I mean, the Bible is showing there's a distinction here between Judah, who Messiah would come through, and 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 Israel, the house of Israel, Ephraim, who received the firstborn blessing. This was always his plan that through this division, through this sowing of Israel throughout the nation. And by his dividing the houses, there would be a multiplication. And once you see that multiplication and that this entity we call the church is the house of Israel gathered, grafted back, the wild olive trees grafted back into the singular olive tree that is Israel, whose root is Yeshua. And, and again, they don't have an explanation for that. When I ask someone who's a dispensationalist, and, and and some of them know where I'm going. They go, do you still believe that you're excluded from the Commonwealth of Israel? They will not answer that question if they're familiar with Ephesians 2. If they're not familiar with it, they'll go, of course I'm not. I'll quote Ephesians 2, then they disappear. Same thing. You're a wild olive tree. What olive tree are you grafted into? What is the olive tree? Do you believe Paul is just making up new metaphors, just randomly pulling them out of his hat? And again, they don't want to, most people, guys, they don't want to be Israel. They they want to be the church because mm. then the church gets to like ignore a lot of those old laws and things, you know, like, like we get to say, well, maybe heaven and earth really did pass away. Yeah, maybe Jesus did, I mean, this is fundamental. Uh, it, it really, they uh, get yeah. to then divide up Jesus and pretend that heaven and earth have passed away and we can just ignore it and have our ham sandwiches and we can do Christmas <laughs> and Easter. This is this is really part of it. Well, what people need to realize is, uh, you know, you not only have Ephesians 2 and 3 and, uh, and Romans 9 through 11 and the grafting in, but you have prophecies in the Old Testament that say that the house of Israel and the house of Judah are going to be united. So this dispensational idea that they're to be kept separate, it, it completely contradicts what the Old Testament prophecies say God is going to fulfill. So that's pretty ridiculous. Now, I also 
thought about this idea of the shadows, you know, and having to have an object to cast a shadow. And so if you don't see shadows of a pre-tribulation rapture in the Old Testament and you don't see shadows of a pre-tribulation rapture in the Gospels, then uh, you have to ask the question, is it really there? Is that is that object that's casting a shadow that you think is, is it really there? Because you're looking to uh, the Old Testament as, as types and shadows. And wait a minute, there's there's a shadow missing here. Chris, I will say there is a shadow for protection through trials and tribulation and keeping. In other words, we see that Noah was 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 you know, protected through the flood and preserved. We see that Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel's three friends, they were protected through the fire. Daniel was protected uh, it, through the lion's den. Lot and his family were removed, but they weren't raptured off to third heaven for a seven-year wedding feast. In other words, I believe those are legitimate types and shadows in Genesis, in Exodus, in, in you know, that do point to how God will protect his people through the tribulation. When you read those trumpet judgments, we ain't got nothing to worry about in those trumpet judgments. Now we might get our head cut off by the beast system. We won't be able to buy and sell things, but worst case scenario is you get your head chopped off. Um, you know, I'd rather have that happen than be tortured to be honest with you, but that's the worst thing scenario. All those other trumpet judgments, we don't have to worry about those. No. Things. In fact, uh, Paul says that in Romans chapter eight, when he says, uh, who shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And, and one of the rhetorical questions is shall tribulation. So obviously he, that's what he's talking about is mm -hmm. we're able to, to, to go through that. Um, so that kind of answers the question if, if we're going to come under God's wrath. Well, we're told right there, we can't be separated from the love of God. Love and wrath are kind of opposites, aren't they? <laughs> and that's what yeah. Paul's getting yeah. at. Yeah, I, I have the uh, emperor's new clothes here that uh, everybody was fawning over them, how beautiful they are. Oh, your majesty, they're wonderful. And yet, we, you know, it was the little boy who was finally honest and said, I don't see anything. He's naked, right? And, and that's what I think we're really talking about when we talk about the pre-trib rapture is, you know, like we just said, if it's not, there's no shadows of it. It's not in the Old Testament. It's not in the Gospels. And the, the best we have are shadows and types of some kind of catching away or gathering or something uh, before the tribulation. Well, we're, we're not talking about substance. We're just we're pretending that there's something there when it isn't really there. Okay, and again, I, I put his his points here. The rapture of the body of Christ is not found in the Old Testament. The rapture is also not found in the Gospels. Okay, so then let's admit it. We're talking about the emperor's new clothes. It's not there now. In in my in my presentation here, I want to go back just a, just a couple. Uh, I've got lots of slides, but again, I don't want to belabor this. Okay, but just to look at a few more here. Right. These are all on the list. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. OK, great. We know the sons of God are going to be revealed, but it doesn't say before the tribulation. First Corinthians 1, 7. So that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end guiltless. In the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he's coming, but it doesn't say anything about a pre-trib timing kind of rapture. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. I tell you, ministry, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, we shall be changed. For the perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Again, where is the pre-trib reference it's not there that there is a resurrection hallelujah that there is a transformation of the body hallelujah but it does not say anything about the timing right and then he has all these other ones uh, in this list here 
You know, um, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be a curse. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven and not, and from it we wait a, a way to Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Hallelujah. That's talking about the resurrection, but it's not giving us a timing of a pre-trib rapture. It's not there. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Where is the, where is it? It's not there. So when you keep looking at this list, you find that eh, it's not really there. Okay. It's not anywhere. Hey, Doug, can you pull up Second yeah. Thessalonians chapter 1? And I, I mean, it's, it's actually very clear even in Paul's writings when this happens. Uh, maybe start at verse uh, 6. But hold on. I have to. I got to change my screens for that. Okay. So one second. <laughs> Just give me a second. And and our friend John Haller has brought this up that no pre tribulation teacher even deals with chapter one of Second Thessalonians. Uh huh. Uh, but yeah, if we go to verse right. six, um, since is okay. So so the Thessalonians are are undergoing a lot of tribulation, and so Paul is writing to them basically saying, "Hey guys, hold on." There's going to be some righteous judgment coming. So since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation, those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Not when you're not going to get tribulation when you're secretly raptured out of here. In other words, this is when he is with his holy ones, with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, when he comes to be glorified among his saints, verse 10, on that day. So when is this? When he is coming to, to deal out with retribution at his coming. This is, this is like a, should be a slam dunk to this nonsense of, of, of yeah. a secret yeah. appearing and we're gathered before bad things happen. Yeah. When are these people glorified? When he's dealing out retribution on That's that right. day of the That's Lord, right. which the first part of that day is not just 24 hours. It's, it's a, but it ain't going to be a good time if you're not in, in well, Christ at that, yeah. on that day. What we also see there that's very important is that he's coming with his mighty angels People uh, say, well, it, uh, isn't the church coming back? Mm. Mm -hmm. And it, it says this um, in Matthew as well. Jesus uh, it talks about him coming mm -hmm. uh, in glory with his mighty angels. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the same thing in Jude. Uh, it says his holy ones, but That's right. Agios. It only means holy ones, and it's it's translated as either yep. angels or holy ones. Uh, yep. And so the, this whole uh, translation of the word saints is is kind of uh, subjective. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a, uh, well, because yeah. it's, so it's the same it's the things. same term in Deuteronomy thirty two. I think it is where you know the Lord comes from. Uh, oh gosh. Uh, it comes from Mount Sinai with all of his holy ones, right? And there he's talking definitely about angels. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, look at verse 9 as well. So the people that Jesus is going to come in flaming fire, okay? He says, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now, I used to read this for what it's worth. I used to read this as they're going to, that, you know, the sinners are going to be put away they're going to be put over here in this, this bad place, uh, away from Jesus, far away. But that's not what it means here. The word here is apple. And apple can mean to be, yes, to be apart from, but it can also be because of, right? So if you say that he died from smoke inhalation, he died from cancer, or he died of cancer, that's the same word that's being used here. So why are they destroyed? Because of his presence. And what does his presence look like? Flaming fire, right? He's coming in flaming fire. That is what it's going to be like, right? His presence is flaming fire. And that flaming fire is going to is going to cause 
everlasting destruction from the presence, from the face of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So they're destroyed on account of his power, by virtue of his power. So this is all talking about the second coming. It's not talking about any kind of a you know pre-trib, secret rapture, or anything like that uh, that, that people have, have come up with. The yeah, that's why we're transformed. Uh, that's why we have to be transformed uh, at his coming. That's why it's describing that there in in First Thessalonians four, um, that the resurrection of, of the dead, and then we'll be transformed together with them, so that we can endure, so that we will have our glorified bodies, so that we can endure uh, the consuming fire of of the presence of the Lord. A little different topic. Pull that verse back up, Doug. It, it, this is this is what's sobering here in in verse eight because our dispensational brothers, a lot of them, will teach about Paul's gospel, or they'll teach that Paul taught a different gospel than than Yeshua did. Well, Paul Paul flat out says no, he only taught the what Jesus taught. But in those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, the, this this gospel of easy peasy, greasy grace, yes, there's always been grace, but it is not a license to sin. And if you're not obeying the Lord, he ain't your savior. And so that that, you know, again, I just we're talking about something that in all honesty has been academic and it's sort of academic. And it, it really does not matter except for that terminal generation as far as as far as what the timing is but the the scary part about dispensationalism is they're teaching a i believe i'm not going to call it false but it is a watered down incorrect at best and i'm being nice gospel but due to due to the way they divide up the word and they call it rightly dividing the word but but what they end up doing is is exactly what Peter warned about. They they twist mm. Paul's letters, they pervert Paul's letters to justify a lawless gospel. And I'm not even talking about ham sandwiches or Sabbath right now. I, I mean, so, I'm talking about like like literally because again, I grew up Southern Baptist. I mean, once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved. You know, I we've got out, JJ. I, yeah, we've got JJ in the chat. Uh, so here's a question. I'm going to throw this out to anybody uh, just for sake of time, because we're almost out of time. Uh, there is. Uh, so he says that, uh, you know, all of this stuff is a straw man argument. So we should <laughs> stay with the scriptures as is Revelation 3, 10 and 11. All right. So here it is. Stay with it. Amen. All right. All right so, um, Chris, you address this a little bit. Scott, if you want to jump in, go for it. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe he wasn't there uh, <laughs> during that part of the part of the program where we talked about uh, the words there of, uh, of being uh, kept and, uh, and, and taken out and how Jesus used those in John 17. And he says, I, I don't want you taken out of the world, but that you be kept from the evil one. And so uh, the, the terminology, the Greek that's there in Philipp in uh, the church of Philadelphia and then also pointed out that it's the wrong church, that it's the church of Laodicea that is there supposedly at the end of the church age. So it's it's completely inapplicable. No, it doesn't tell us everything. In fact, it doesn't tell us anything about a pre-trib rapture. Mm. I There's would agree another... with the last statement, but certainly don't don't have the historicism view that we're in. The I, I think uh, those seven assemblies uh, are are not not what our reformed and SDA brethren interpret them as. In other words, we're, we, those, those assemblies are, are, are top, tip, typified, typified, however you want to call it, through, throughout, the, throughout the history of Israel. I mean, again, I, 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 I despise the term church age because there has been Israel now for about 3,500 years as far as a nation. And nothing has changed. There's nothing changed. They were looking forward to when Yeshua would come as the lamb. We're looking backwards. But well, I think nothing... people need to understand that the uh, Greek Septuagint uses the word ecclesia 
uh, throughout for the mm -hmm. gathering of Israel, Israel mm -hmm. and the assembly mm -hmm. of Israel. And so ecclesia isn't a new word when it's used in the New Testament. It, it, it existed all throughout the Old Testament. And it wasn't even used in translations. Uh, in fact, the word was translated congregation by the early English translated, translators. And it wasn't until the King James Bible uh, that uh, that word was translated as church, uh, which is really a, a pagan circle gathering for uh, pagan gods. But they adopted that term uh, for the building basically and, and so congregation is the appropriate word translation of ecclesia and it's used throughout old testament and new testament the adah, the adah is translated congregation and, and in the greek Septuagint, the first use of the term ecclesia is for the adah of israel the congregation of israel and and we see that in our modern at least i'll give king jimmy Same credit king, you know I was going to give King Jimmy credit. At least they were consistent. They translated in Acts 7, they translated it as the church in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And the modern translations will change that to congregation or assembly because they don't want anybody confused <laughs> thinking that, that, you know, that the church is not something new. And so we there's translation bias that, that, that gets into into what we are well, and then once we've learned it like like jj i like the guy but man he is going to go down unless his eyes are open or he ever has ears to hear he's just going to believe this till the day he dies it is like gospel to him well it's important to understand that when uh, the whole keys of the kingdom conversation with with peter that um he said upon this rock, you know, I, I will build my church. He didn't say I'll create my congregation, but that he would build or edify his congregation. And by the same token, we need to also understand that uh, the, the new covenant in the blood of Jesus is a new covenant. And so what was done for the congregation of God by the coming of Christ is astounding. It's phenomenal. It's different. It, we're a new creation in mm -hmm. Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we've got a Jesus only. Yeah. Um, and but we also see that, especially in the book of Hebrews, where we see uh, and even in uh, first Corinthians in uh, chapter 10, uh, examples of, of, of Christ um, and the baptism of Christ um, in, into Christ. So those who died in faith, in other words, uh, the Old Testament saints who, who had faith, uh, trusting in God to send Messiah, that we're all, um, we're all brought together at one time. I can't remember the verse in, in oh. Hebrews, but... Uh, Hebrews so there. Hebrews 4 talks about the good news that was preached to Israel in the mm -hmm. wilderness. It's the same exact word. Yeah, Let, let's uh, let's go to this question. We're running out of time. This is from Joel. Who are the Hagios, the saints, that is, in Revelation 13, 7 through 10? Why would Yeshua describe the believers as ecclesia in early Revelation and as Hagios in later chapters? Could it be Yeshua has a time to discuss uh, congregation versus hagios. Hmm. Well, there are times, you know, in the English language, uh, to be um, oh, literary, uh, flourish. Uh, the same word will be translated uh, in our Bible mm -hmm. from the same Greek word in, in in several different words. A lot of times, and there are different Greek words yeah, that mean think, the same thing. And yeah. so, uh, you know, it's not uncommon for for these things to be interchanged. Right. Um, Here's a good example. I, I think it's also important that we understand that this is from Daniel as well, right? So it's granted him to make war with the saints. That's the exact same language. The same was making war against the saints. I would argue that that is why uh, the reason is that John here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is really making a very clear correlation, a connection with 
the holy people, whatever, right? And Daniel and the same people in Revelation chapter 13. And the ecclesia is an assembly, and these are letters to, not to not to Chris, not to Doug, not to Scott, not to JJ. They are, these are letters to the assembly, the congregations of these communities, and and it's not coincidence why those seven were chosen. And and again, I I, I believe Helisa has, has has some insight on this. The seven assemblies that that Johann and John would have would have known would have been the seven feasts of the Lord. Um, and and, you know, that's just not something that you're going to learn in in a King James only church or a fundamental Baptist. Like we, we had a King James only person in here and we're all lost because we don't. And, and just bless their heart. I, I have zero patience for King James only people. So I love them, but man, you might as well just go outside and hit your head against a brick wall. <laughs> no. it's just, I'm just being honest. I mean, if you've ever had a conversation with a with a with a hardcore dispensationalist, and they're generally King James only, I mean, it's it's like it's like a brainwash. So based on re related to that idea, here's a question from Tim Rawlings: Is Pre-trib a deception by the enemy that is part of apostasy. So, um, well, let me just chime in on that one. Um, so, Tim, I, I, so look, I think I think pre-trib is is mistaken. Uh, whether it's a deception by the enemy, I suppose any anything that's in, in somehow mistaken could be something used by the enemy. I would be very careful though. Because I think once we start saying, well, that everything that my opponents believe is absolutely wrong, everything I believe is absolutely right, I think that's one, very arrogant. I mean, I believe everything I believe because I do think it's right, but I'm wise enough and I think I'm humble enough to suggest that I might have a few things wrong. And so I don't want to be throwing stones at everybody. So I'd be very I think careful. Also, everybody should realize that we, none of us uh, see this as a salvation issue. Right, right, right. Um, and that's kind of one of the differences between those who, um, unfortunately, there, there are some pre-trib people who do see it as a salvation issue, <laughs> that you're denying the very love of God uh, and his, uh, his uh, ability to keep you out of, going through any kind of trials in your life. It's kind of the prosperity Shady. gospel. And uh, so I think we're not on that side, though. Uh, we think that uh, because Doug and I, at least I think all three of us, came out uh, from under uh, the pre-trib teaching, and uh, we were saved before, and we're still saved. The the I mean again there are some like J D Farrakh and and Jan Markell I've listened to it they called anybody that does not teach and believe in the blessed hope of the rapture prior to a seven year tribulation period demonic and satanic wow. now Amir Safardi sat there and didn't say anything he didn't push back but he didn't join in with them but it was a it was discussion with the three of them. And so there are those that are militant in um, and mm -hmm. even saying that that we're teaching a false gospel because we actually believe Yeshua meant what he said in Matthew 24. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, we have looked at a lot. We've not looked at all of uh, the ins and outs of the pre-trib rapture doctrine uh, but these are sort of the highlights as to why we would suggest that there is no such thing as a pre-trib rapture all right uh, and i know scott uh, hates the term rapture and i understand why he thinks that way uh it's not my favorite term either i think the much better term is the term gathering and that term we see all over the place in fact if you want to get uh, uh chris and, and my book um, we talk about the gathering together. In fact, really, that is kind of the subtitle is the um, it's restoring the doctrine of the gathering of the two houses of Israel or the houses of Israel and Judah at the last day. Right. Because scripture is replete with uh, passages talking about the gathering of both the house of Israel and the house of Judah 
Sometimes it talks about Ephraim. Sometimes it talks about Joseph. I mean, you can go to Ezekiel 37. I mean, it is in every single prophet out there, right? Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Zechariah. It's, they're all talking about the gathering. Even it talks about it in Leviticus, right? It talks about it in Deuteronomy. The Deuteronomy 30. Of God's people, right? It's all over the place. If you look at the word gathering, and this is why Scott scoffs when we say the word rapture. I get it. Uh, it's because I know I get it. I get it. It's because the word gathering is all over the place. And guess who else talks about this? Hmm, this guy named Paul. Okay. Paul talks about the gathering. And, and that is why really rapture is very much a, uh, a worn out term that we really should try to get away from. Uh, I, I know it's hard to reform everybody, yeah. but, but it's and, a term and, we should try to get away from. And in my, in my opinion, a, a much better translation is the, the plundering or the spoiling, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which is the redemption of the body. Yes. Yeah. And uh, guys, I <laughs> encourage you to get the book because... Chris does an excellent job. Uh, that is one of his chapters. And uh, he does an excellent job really talking about that. The, the difference uh, in the way that this word is used, it's it's a active or passive uh, type usage. Um, uh, and then there's more to the more to the discussion. But basically, it's to take something from you versus being taken. OK, so I can come and say, give me your money and I can take your wallet. I'm taking it from you. Versus if I come and I take you, I kidnap you, right? So that is really what, what Chris is, is arguing here is that that death itself is taken out of the believer, right? And now we are uh, changed at that point. So this is more of a resurrection reference. And, and that's what Paul's talking about, right? They have no hope. Oh, no, all of our loved ones have died. Hey, don't be with those like who don't have hope because... Right? They're getting He's resurrected. Back. And guess what's going to happen? The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then we who are alive will be what? <laughs> we changed. will be transformed. We'll be changed, right? And we'll meet the Lord, right? So that is the whole point of, of what Chris is arguing there. I think it's I think it's great oh, stuff. I'm a little biased, and, but but and first Corinthians 15 is just it it just it it teaches more doctrine on that issue. Mm -hmm. The corruptible. Uh, can uh, the corruptible cannot inherit the incorruptible. And so there will be that metamorphosis, that change mm -hmm. in the twinkling of an eye, I believe as this, as this sixth day, this age ends. And as that seventh day, that next age begins, that's when those that are alive at that point in time will be m metamorphosized, will, will, will become incorruptible. We will get that glorified body. And, and obviously my daddy who died actually, I think seven years ago today, if I'm alive at the end, he's going to beat me. He's going to get raised first. He's going to get his body, um, I, you know, according to First Thessalonians 4, they get raised first. That's awesome. That's the comfort. It's not about avoiding tribulation or even the mm. great tribulation at the end of this age. Yeah. That's just. Uh, uh, so here, I, I know we're out of time, but I. This is from uh, Unity Tech Future. Love you all, but Noah is a prime proof of rapture. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of comments, and we don't have time to get to all of them. I'm sorry. But um, let's discuss that, okay? Let, let's, you know, so we got we, some people. We all agree saying, there's a rapture. Right. Or, uh, or gathering, right? Right. Yeah. For, for uh, Scott's sake. Okay. Chris, go ahead. Oh, that's, that's all. We're, we're discussing the timing of the rapture we 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 firmly believe that uh we will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye uh that's that we have to to endure being in the presence of the lord but i think noah is more of a typology of how god can protect people through even mm -hmm. when he even through the judgment mm -hmm. noah was protected through that time period he was not transformed or changed i i see that as more of and i do see some evidence where there's going to be some supernatural sealing some supernatural protection some supernatural hiding for the elect through this time period not everybody some are destined for imprisonment some are destined for death mm -hmm. but i do think that there is going to be 
a supernatural. I mean, guys, just read your Bible. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into a furnace that killed the soldiers that threw them in. It was so hot. And yet there was a fourth person, Yeshua, walking around with them, and they came out. They didn't even smell like smoke. What's going on in Revelation and those trumpet judgments and everything? We do not have to be worried about it. Even, even if I believe that the bowls are poured out after the gathering, after we are transformed, but even if we were alive, what's going on is we are promised that we will not face that wrath. And even if he's pouring this out on it, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just like Daniel, just like Noah, just like Lot, there can be protection through this time period. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I, if we just right. believe, if we just believe what right. what what we actually read in the Bible, I mean. Right. So JJ is saying, forget the pre-trib argument, focus on Revelation three ten uh, instead. So, <laughs> all right. So JJ, we already discussed, and correct us if we're wrong here, but the Church of Philadelphia is the church that that was promised to. So that means you have to have a whole scheme of where church history is, is, you know, each church is representing a specific era, an epoch of church history. Who's to say where one begins and one ends, right? We don't know that, right? It's very subjective. And it seems to only apply, as from the people that I've read, it only applies to the Western church. What about the church in the rest of the world? What about the Chinese church? What about the African church? What, you know, what about the church in India? I mean, there's so many different places that have other church things going on. And yet the people who are preaching that, that uh, the church of Philadelphia, that's us, of course, as people would say, you know, well, it doesn't make sense, right? It leaves out a whole bunch of stuff. So, you know, you have that to, to consider. Also, JJ, I would argue, I'd encourage you to forget what you're suggesting and look at all the other scriptures that we've been talking about, because there are tons of scriptures that talk about a gathering. And this is what, you know, you're doing. It's kind of willful ignorance is that you're not wanting to look at the rest of the Bible. I'm talking Genesis up through Revelation that talk about a gathering of God's people, a gathering of the house of Israel and the house of Judah, right? So that is being completely left out in the pre-trib doctrine. Here. And it's a huge mistake. Just real quick then on that imminent thing, Israel ain't, and I'm going to use a Southern word, ain't getting gathered until Israel, we corporately as an ecclesia do our part, which is return to his commandments, repent of our sins. And it's then then that is when Israel is gathered. I believe the great tribulation is for our benefit. It is so that we will repent. We will return. We will be refined. We will be purified. Because right now, the church as a whole, it's not pure. It's, 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 it's not the bride of Christ. Um, there, that's a different topic as to whether or not all the elect are the bride. But Deuteronomy 30 is really clear when this happening, when this gathering occurs. The scattering has happened. The gathering occurs when people, when his people return to his way and his truth. And JJ, I love you, brother, but you are as blind as a bat and deaf as a mute <laughs> when it comes to understanding that the whole Bible applies to you, brother. Every bit of it. All right. Heaven and earth have not passed away. That's and you true. have inherited lies straight from Rome. All period. Right. Hey, Chris, can you hold up that book one more time? Some people are asking about it. So okay. Yep. This is uh, Reclaiming the Rapture. You can get this on Amazon. You can also get the uh, uh, e-copy on DouglasHamp.com if you're interested. One of these days, we're going to make that into an audio book. Uh, we're getting around to that. Nice. <laughs> so uh we're working on it but um uh yeah so jeff definitely check that out we're glad you guys joined us you know the bottom line here guys we don't believe that the doctrine of the gathering or the rapture is a salvific um doctrine right this is an interesting doctrine 
something that we used to believe we don't see it anymore. And we do think that it can cause a lot of damage if people really put all their hope in that. And that's what I used to do. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's just not going that direction in our humble opinion. So you can take it or leave it. That's where we stand on that. Uh, but we do want to bless, you know, everybody else. We want to bless our pre-trib rapture brothers. Um, you know, God is going to come and he's going to straighten us all out at the end. So thank you, Lord. All right. Well, uh, guys, again, uh, you can join us. I hope you will for our trip to Israel in April 2024. Go to thewaycongregation.com. If you want to sow into this ministry, that'd be awesome. You can go to patreon.com forward slash Doug Ham. Uh, you can do, you know, the price of a cup of coffee a month, or you can do more. All right. Uh, it's really up to you. Thank you. It, it helps tremendously to uh, keep the lights on and pay the mortgage and all that stuff so that uh, I can keep focusing on this and uh, all that we're doing here at this ministry. So thank you again. Until next time, God bless you and always stay.